They are the deadliest special forces in the medieval world. Their symbol is the dagger. Experts in disguise, masters of stealth. They strike out of nowhere. They made themselves appear like ghosts. They would come in, stab, disappear. Terror is their greatest weapon. It's psychological warfare. Um, it's about the impact that you have. This is the story of how a tiny community takes on the most feared warlords of their day. They were a small, marginalized, persecuted sect. They would become a legend. The first true assassins. miles north of Jerusalem lies the port of Tyre. In the 12th century, it is a crusader stronghold. Its ruler, Conrad of Montferrat, is about to become the most powerful man in the Holy Land, the Crusader King. That night, Conrad is returning home from dinner. He's going along a particularly narrow street. There's two men sat one on either side. He believes they are monks, trusted members of his household. But Conrad is about to fall victim to the most feared black ops force of his time, the legendary assassins. origins of the assassins lie hundreds of miles away from the Holy Land, in 11th century Persia, the country we now know as Iran. The Islamic world is torn apart by the age-old struggle between Sunni and Shiite Muslims. It's a division about who follows the truest Islamic tradition. The Sunni believe that they are the, the rightful preservers of that tradition. They're the party of, of the community. Their rivals, the Shiites, support a different tradition that takes its authority from the Prophet Muhammad's descendants. The followers of Ali, the son-in-law and the cousin of the Prophet, say that the Imams, the political religious leaders of their faith, should descend from him. Even today, this rivalry within Islam fuels bitter religious conflict. In a remote area of northern Persia is the mountain fortress of Alamut. It is here that a particular Shiite community, the Ismailis, takes refuge. They were a small, marginalized, persecuted sect of Islam at a time when it was extremely unhealthy to be any of those things. Their base is known as the Eagle's Nest. Alamut itself is a natural fortress. It's not like a crusader castle that's built with a tremendous amount of science, but it sits atop a natural redoubt that's 300 feet, almost like a sheer cliff. 
and at the bottom, you've got very deep gorges. It's very, very difficult to approach. The leader of this small remote community is Hassan E. Sabah, a charismatic man who demands total devotion from his followers. One wonders if he had a rather magnetic or perhaps hypnotic personality about him as well to draw these people to him, despite the fact that he's actually asking them to submit to a very, very harsh regime indeed. Hassan's Ismailis are facing overwhelming odds. His Sunni enemies have a vast army of 300,000 men. He will have to wage what we now call asymmetric warfare. He's not in a position to fight back. He's not got large armies at his disposal. To survive, Hassan has to find something he can do even with limited manpower. Finally, he hits on a radical solution. He will decapitate his Sunni enemies by murdering their leader. They're not going to be able to defeat him in battle, so they go in on a much narrower front. They're going to take out the man himself. At the top of the Persian hierarchy, Nizam al-Mulk is a champion of Sunni orthodoxy. He's basically a one-man government, and he has made it his work to root out heresy right at the center of the Persian state. Hassan's Ismailis are one of his prime targets. He's described them as the pus of sedition. He really thinks they should be expelled. So if Hassan picks him out and if he removes him, he really will be striking a blow against the man who is the real cheerleader against his group. Hassan starts to train an elite squad to carry out the mission. They're chosen from his most devoted followers the Fidayeen. The uh, early Fidayeen were almost certainly from that particular area of Iran. So these are tough mountain men. Hassan begins by teaching them how to fight at close quarters. Their actual personal skills are in many ways much higher than you find in armies today. So commandos, won't be so well trained in individual hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because they have technology, people today rely on technology, then they had no technology, it was just them. They were the weapon. The key question is how to make the hit, to take out their target. They could have killed people using poison. But the victim could take an antidote and survive. They could have killed people using arrows or, or, or projectile weapons. But there's always the risk of missing the vital organs. Eventually, the weapon they choose is the dagger. Striking up close, you can make sure of a kill. A dagger gives you a greater chance of actually achieving your aim. But using daggers in combat demands immense skill. Throughout history, there's only three different types of weapons available in a dagger. You have a stabbing, you have a slashing, and you have a slashing and stabbing. Now, the first one we have is something like a stiletto. The key point about the stiletto is it's very strong, thin blade for high penetration power. So a stabbing of a stiletto goes straight through, so in and stab through. With the weapon concealed, you walk towards it, pull out, stab, walk on. The next type is a slashing blade. From here, they will just draw and slash. 
As you can see, in one motion, it would be very hard to even see that it happened. The third major design would be a slashing and stabbing weapon. And this is a modern version. So from here, it's got a sharp blade that curves. It would also have a back blade, so you can cut back if you miss. Very strong guard here. This guard allows you to stab down very heavily. So you have different options as to how you move and how to combine it. The Ismaili's next step is familiar to today's special forces, to gather local intelligence on their target. It's a big operation. It will require inside knowledge. An Ismaili spy infiltrates the Sunni leader's headquarters, watching Nizam al-Mulk's every move. How does he conduct his life? What's the best opportunity we can get? Where is there a chink in that armor? This information is fed back to base. With a detailed profile of his target, Hassan identifies what he thinks is a weakness in Al-Mulk's security. That weakness is his religion. This is the only way he's going to actually get that close to him. And he calls on a man to represent a Sufi mystic, a holy man, an ascetic, somebody who normally one would never suspect of misdeed. A Sufi would be seen as a man of peace. Anybody who has an air of holiness about them is almost guaranteed a warm reception from a powerful leader of the secular state, such as Nizam al-Mulk. The opportunity to be blessed by such an individual is not to be missed. Having worked out how to get close to him, Hassan's next problem is how to kill him. The trick is to use distraction. The person must be distracted by an event, so you trip or you drop something and this moment you exploit it. The chosen killer rehearses the technique. After months of training, he is ready. Hassan's trained killer infiltrates the Sunni base. No one suspects a holy man. In the quarters of Nizam al-Mulk, there is no sense of any threat. Everything is routine. At this time of the evening, Nizam al-Mulk is probably in high spirits. He has finished his work for the day. This is perfect timing for the Ismailis. He's much more difficult to actually get anywhere near during the normal working business day. So no doubt in his own mind, he's thinking of the pleasures of the evening among his women. In the shadows, the Ismaili killer waits for the moment to strike. Al-Mulk is about to be carried off to his harem, on his litter. But then, he 
he sees the Sufi holy man approaching. He's quite prepared to let this guy in and give him a blessing on his way. He stabs the man, stabs Nizam al-Mulk and kills him. The distraction has worked. Killing the leader of the Sunnis is a massive triumph for Hassan's Ismailis. He was a great man, no two ways about it. And therefore, to take him down was a real message. If we can get him, we can get anybody. So you take on the Ismailis of Alamut at your peril. Over the coming years, Hassan presses home his advantage. He launches a range of terror attacks, which would be familiar to us today. There's about 25 assassinations in this early period. They really do enter quite a little golden patch or a purple patch where they have a number of successes. They would prepare to do anything to win. The way that the assassins killed was absolutely amazing. They made themselves appear like ghosts. They would come in, stab, disappear. They changed their mode of operating every single time. Only one thing stayed the same, and that was that they killed by a dagger. Their murder of Al-Mulk triggers the collapse of his Sunni empire. They've proved that their tiny force can take on a vastly superior enemy and win. They were one of the first groups who used deliberately small groups of highly trained men in asymmetric warfare. The success of Hassan's elite killers becomes a talking point on the streets. They are celebrated across the Middle East in a popular poem. It says that with one lone warrior on foot, a king, though he may have a hundred thousand troopers, would be in fear. Soon, the Ismailis discover that like today's suicide bombers, their strategy has a secondary effect. They create an atmosphere of dread. With terrorism, the fundamental thing you have to remember is that it's psychological warfare. It's not really about how many people you kill. Um, it's about the impact that you have. It's all the more fearsome because Hassan's men aren't afraid to die. The Sunnis face a huge problem with the Ismailis because the men that are sent on these missions happily embrace death. And that obviously makes them truly terrifying. The echoes today are very familiar. But there is one key difference. The Fidayeen's method is much more precise. It doesn't have collateral damage. It doesn't strike at innocence. It strikes specifically, cleanly, and discriminately at the target. The Ismaili strike force is so successful, their Sunni enemies try to discredit them. They spread stories about a secret group of brainwashed killers living up in the mountains. They were painted as deviants, as drug users, as um, crazy fanatics. And in, in much the same way that modern terrorist groups often get the same treatment, that um, you know, they're fanatics, um, psychopaths. The myth becomes more and more exotic. 
Both Muslims and Western Christians retell the story of young killers manipulated by an evil leader. There's talks of potions, uh, promises of, of pleasure gardens forever. Some of the ideas begin to blur a little, that they must be perhaps drug-induced to have this level of devotion. In particular, the Sunnis label them Hashishian, or users of Hashish. The name has stuck. This morphed into the word that we use today for a political killer, assassin. And so, a legend is born. Hassan's special forces become known as the drug-crazed assassins. I don't personally believe that they would have been on drugs. Imagine the focus you need. You need to confirm that target. The thing about drugs is it has an effect. It suppresses or depresses or enlightens. What it does is take away your focus. But defeating Nizam al-Mulk is only the beginning. In the future, they will need to use all their fighting skills to defend their community not only against their Muslim enemies, but a new threat from Christian Crusaders. Some 50 years later, in the mountains of northern Syria, the Ismaili assassins establish a new base at Masyaf. They take over a network of castles to protect their growing community, soon to be some 60,000 strong. But here in the Holy Land, they find themselves in the middle of an even more dangerous power struggle. A religious war is raging between Sunni Muslims and the Crusaders from the West. At stake is control of the city of Jerusalem and its sacred places of worship. The Grand Master of the Assassins in the Holy Land is Rashid al-Din Sinan, a charismatic leader. He's got a personality not dissimilar to that of Hassan is Sabah, the first great grand master. Again, hypnotic, also very engaging, erudite, highly intelligent, very intellectual, but also a paranormal feeling about him. He's supernatural, he's more than this world. There is enormous devotion and obedience to him. If he tells one of his followers to go and take somebody out to kill them, then they will certainly obey his commands. Caught between the Sunni Muslims and the Christian Crusaders, Sinan decides to target the man he sees as his biggest threat, the leader of the Sunnis. Saladin the Great is the finest warrior of his age. He has won a string of victories against the Crusaders. He wants to draw the Near East together, Egypt, Syria, northern Iraq, under his rule. He is also a fanatical champion of the Sunnis. He is incredibly orthodox as a Sunni. We know that he carried out crucifixions of what are unorthodox or heretical thinkers. Saladin is a deadly menace to the Ismaili assassins. He is now number one on their hit list. In classic assassin fashion, they begin by gathering information for their mission. Syria's bustling cities 
are an ideal source of intelligence. The first thing to do is to start dispatching missionaries to recruit locals and build up a network and then this network would bring back information and, 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 um, uh, and intelligence from what was happening there. They recruit agents most likely to give them local knowledge. There's a constant flux and mix of merchants, and we know that Ismaili penetration into the merchant class was very strong. So there's a grassroots intelligence available to Sunan. His real skill is that he taps into that so well. We hear stories of him using things like carrier pigeons for communication, but I think what's more important is that in his own mind, he maps out the various pressure points and power plays that are occurring in Syria. To target a warlord of Saladin's stature, Sinan has to find a way of dealing with his close protection team. These leaders in a very, very hostile and dangerous world will have had the very best bodyguards in the business. The very best bodyguards. Because your life depended on selecting the right guys. Sinan's network needs to provide detailed intelligence on Saladin's security. It would be really important to find out how their bodyguards moved what they did, what they were trained in, how reactive they were. But you would also learn when to exploit the bodyguards, because it's the same for today. No one can be 100% alert all the time. That's where the intelligence network is key. You would find out as much as you can about them. Armed with this information, the assassins can start training. They need to learn how to tackle the bodyguards. They have to know how to use this sword. Why? For a very simple reason. If you want to beat your opponent, it's not just what you do, you need to understand them. If they're going to draw their sword, how do you defeat that? The knife can even be used to take out an armed sentry. So as he goes with his gun, you stop him pulling out, you stab him in. They practice how to take out a single sentry. The first thing you must do is grab his head, pull him in, and then you finish with another stab. Next, how to tackle two bodyguards. The weapon is hidden, and you walk forward in a calm and composed and respectful manner. Pull out, stabbing two shots, and one more shot to finish. After weeks of training, the assassins have one final problem to solve. How to infiltrate Saladin's camp. It's likely they go in disguised as soldiers. They were very, very good at doing this. I mean, they, they were able to get people into the most trusted positions because they blended in. They did not seem like a threat. They did not seem like an outsider. Two hundred miles north of the Assassin's territory, Saladin is on campaign. He has no reason to fear a personal attack. He is relaxing in his tent on the day chosen for the strike. The Assassins make their move. the bodyguards proved too strong. For Sinan, it's a setback, not a complete disaster. He's at least shown his enemy he is coming to get him. It gives him the upper hand in the psychological battle with Saladin. 
sign number one, the great Sunni champion starts wearing body armor, 24 hours a day. Saladin knows the assassins never give up. Up in the mountains, Sinan bides his time. His next move is to insert a sleeper cell. The Ismailis are quite prepared to wait. They're quite prepared to put in sleepers, as we might call them. They're quite prepared to wait a great deal of time until it's politically required. Two years later, Saladin is again on campaign in northern Syria. He's unaware the assassins have secretly inserted an agent within his own bodyguard. Only Saladin's body armor saves him. The great warlord can no longer tolerate this threat. He decides to take the attack to the assassins. Saladin lays siege to Sinan's castle at Masyaf. He is determined to eradicate the assassins once and for all. Cut off and surrounded, Sinan is now in real trouble. Even killing Saladin might not save the Ismailis. He needs to make the Sunni leader take his army away. Sinan has to come up with a completely different plan. Sinan has realized something. At this stage, what he can see is it's going to be more effective for him to engage just a little bit with this Sultan. Sinan is going to apply psychological pressure. Legend has it that Sinan himself creeps silently into Saladin's camp and leaves him a note with the assassin's calling card, a dagger. What you wanted to do ideally was intimidate them. The message is very clear, you know, we can, we can get you. We can get you whenever we want. The note reads, Death holds no fear for the Fidayeen. I will defeat you from within your own ranks. The note is truly chilling because he's telling Saladin, you may threaten us with death, you may threaten us with extermination, you're threatening us, uh, threatening us with the very thing that we actually embrace. You're threatening us with something that holds absolutely no fear for us whatsoever. Sinan's scare tactic works. Saladin agrees to open negotiations. Sinan has made a huge psychological dent into uh, Saladin here. Now, he sets up his final trick. He briefs an emissary with a strong message for Saladin. We're not going away. We're indestructible. You'll have to deal with us. Sinan makes it clear this is a message for Saladin alone. The emissary makes his way to Saladin's camp. He insists that he must speak to the Sultan in private. The negotiator says, this is just for your ears, not for anyone else. And Saladin dispatches everyone else except for his two most trusted bodyguards. The emissary again pushes him and says, no, this is just for you. Why do you allow these two men to stay? 
Which lad in replies, I trust these men as my sons. Whatever you can tell me, you can tell them they won't leave. The emissary then plays Sinan's trump card. He turns to the bodyguards and he says, if I order you now to strike this man down, will you do it? For Saladin, it's a shattering moment. His most trusted bodyguards are revealed to be assassins. They're sleeper agents who've been implanted in his organization for years. And right now, if ordered, they will kill him. Now, that doesn't happen. The negotiator's just making a point. We can kill you. you. You trust these people more than anyone else in the whole entourage, and they are actually the assassins. And if these guys can be the assassins, who else might be the assassins? The psychological warfare works. Saladin lifts the siege, and Sinan's assassins are safe again. But their triumph is short-lived. They still face another major force in the Middle East, the Christian Crusaders. For the next 15 years, the Holy Land is a bloody battleground. Muslim and Crusader warriors struggle for control of Palestine and the sacred city of Jerusalem. Finally, it falls to Saladin and his Sunni forces. A hundred miles to the north, the Crusaders still hold the port of Tyre. It is here that a new threat to the assassins is emerging. Tyre's ruler is an ambitious and ruthless crusader baron, Conrad of Montferrat. He's part of a crusading dynasty. He's there for life and he's there to expand his lands. He is a real problem. There was every potential for Conrad to become to the Christians what Saladin had become to the Muslims. He's clearly a powerful figure, a dynamic figure, somebody whom you would need to be aware of. And Conrad has already made enemies of the assassins. There's a story that an assassin ship arrives at the port of Tyre and Conrad has the goods confiscated and the crew taken prisoner. And Sinan says, you should return these things to me and release the people. And twice Conrad says no. Saying no to Sinan is potentially quite dangerous. I think it means that uh, your card is marked. Sinan is so concerned about Conrad's growing strength, he decides to infiltrate his base in Tyre. His plan is to dispatch another sleeper cell. Intelligence agencies today, when they are selecting operators, look for people they call the grey man. Somebody who doesn't stand out from the crowd. If you've got someone who's two metres tall and built to match, he stands out, he's going to attract attention. It's highly likely that the people that the Ismailis selected for this kind of mission, they were people you wouldn't look twice at. In fact, it was very important that they were the kind of people you wouldn't look twice at. Sinan transforms his men into people Conrad will trust. They take on the identity of Christian monks, recent converts to the faith. After centuries of persecution, the assassins know how to live undercover in enemy territory, if necessary, even denying their Shiite faith according to the principle of Taikia. Taikia allows the follower of the faith to deny their faith in order to guarantee their own survival or to obtain an advantage over the unbeliever. The 
assassins have to play their role carefully to avoid raising suspicion. They would need to know the rituals of day-to-day -day life within that community. They would need seamlessly to fit in to the routines of the day. It's a high-risk operation. One slip and Sinan's men could find themselves in a torture chamber. Eventually, they earn Conrad's trust. Relying on the, the usual assassin tricks of being you know, charming and reliable and capable and all the rest of it, you can worm your way into positions of trust and, 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 and security. And that's exactly what they achieved. Over the next six months, they keep a watchful eye on Conrad. At this stage, their orders are to spy on him, not kill him. But then, their plans change. News reaches Tyre that Conrad has been elected the next Crusader King. It will make him the most powerful Christian leader in the region. It's disastrous news for the assassins. Sinan has to act fast. That week, he sends his own messenger to Tyre. It's time to activate his sleepers. Conrad must die. Secretly, the two assassins begin training for the mission. Their weapon is the tried and trusted dagger. But they know they only have one chance. If you're going to kill an opponent, you want to make sure he's dead. You need to confirm the kill. So one day, if you shoot him, you would then shoot him in the head to make sure absolutely he's dead. Well, with the dagger, what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that they target more than one area. Only when they've perfected their moves do the assassins go for the kill. Conrad, the future king of Jerusalem, is waiting to go out to dinner. While it's pretty common for medieval chroniclers to always blame women, uh, there has been a suggestion that his wife was taking too long in the bath, and so he left alone. Conrad walks out into the streets to dine with a friend. Things are coming to a head. We know that Sinan has to get a result, that Conrad must die, because the coronation is coming up soon. So the sleeper cell decides to take its chance at this point. While Conrad's at his friend's house, the assassins take up their positions, ready to catch him on his return. The last moments would be key. You'd be checking to make sure you have absolutely everything and it's working the right way. So, for instance, in your robes, you'd be checking you can pull out and cut straight away. They knew just what they were going to do, and that was what their whole life had been geared up to, was that moment. Later that evening, Conrad begins to make his way back from dinner. I think we can imagine a man who's not really looking for immediate threats that are posed to him. He's going along a particularly narrow street. There's two men sat, one on either side. And when he sees these two figures by the side of the road, 
figures whom we hear that he's apparently reasonably familiar with, I think his guard would certainly have been down. And then they strike. Conrad of Montferrat is dead. The murder of Conrad of Montferrat represents the most high-profile assassination carried out by the group at the Crusader age. So it really had a, a powerful impact. It's a story that would have got across Europe and across the Near East as well. It's not long before rumors begin to spread. It's said that one of the assassins was captured and claimed they were working for Conrad's rivals. Some point the finger at the Crusader warlord, Richard the Lionheart. Others say it was Saladin. This was a very convenient guy to kill, and there were a lot of people who benefited from it. But exactly who instigated it, who wanted it, who endorsed it, we don't know. What we do know is that the assassins would not have killed him if they felt it went there against their interests. Sinan tells no one the true story. It only enhances the myth of the assassins. The assassination of Conrad of Montferrat will be his greatest triumph. Within a year, Sinan is dead. The assassin's exploits in Persia and the Holy Land ensure the survival of the Ismaili faith. This is a, a community and an idea that survives for nearly two centuries against overwhelming odds. After many setbacks, Ismailis continue to thrive around the world. This is the legacy of the assassins who resisted their most powerful enemies for so long.